When you picked the major of cybersecurity, did you have an idea of what your end goal doing cyber was? Or was it just, I want to be in cybersecurity? I had no clue. Like, I didn't really know anything about cybersecurity when they opened the major. It just sounded cool. About what, what internships did you um, I actually was just an IT help desk intern for three years. Was this a job where you were just there? I was just there. And it was mainly just tickets. And most of the tickets that came through, I couldn't even work on because I didn't have like the access, the access or the authority to do it. After the boot camp, how many jobs did you start applying to? Probably over 100. The first interview, the first interview I did land, my first technical interview ever, um, was for an IT help desk position. <laughs> and when it came down to the question of like, okay, so like, what's your salary range of desk position? I said 60000 And... He was like, no. <laughs> and he actually told me, um, you know, your resume is very impressive. You seem great. You're very smart. Um, but honestly, you're you're lucky to have gotten this interview as a woman. Got it a little bit. In this rotational program, what type of salary were you able to either negotiate or get? Um, the position, the intro rotational program position um, starts at 90K. This video is being sponsored by Level Up in Tech. Are you interested in starting a career in cloud computing? The Bureau of Labor Statistics reports that between 2021 and 2031, cloud computing jobs will increase by 15%. LinkedIn is also showing 170K plus roles related to the cloud that are currently open now. Also, the average cloud engineer salary is 132,000. Now you may be sitting there asking yourself, hmm, I want to make $132,000. How do I get into the cloud? Well, Level Open Tech has got you covered. Level Open Tech is a 24 week comprehensive program dedicated to helping you land a cloud role. It will show you everything you need to know related to the cloud. They also have coaches that can guide you and ways on how to help you interview better. Level Open Tech has helped many people start their cloud career and they have so many testimonials on their website. So if you're interested in starting your cloud career, use my link that'll be in the description. Say well, either your favorite movie or what movie are you ready to go see? Okay, maybe this is a little corny, but I think right now at the moment, my favorite movie is the, the new The Color Purple movie. It was really, really good, but I never saw the original. So <laughs> I never saw the original, but yeah, I like the new color purple movie and I'm also kind of like a huge um, Marvel fan. So I liked the Avengers movies, X-Men, actually the X-Men movies are my favorite movies. Really? It's like, yeah. a am not gonna lie. Most of the X-Men movies is like kind of mid and then they had got good. It was not mid first class was very good. <laughs> yeah. First class. Was um, it was a one after that. That was good. Wolverine's origin story was pretty good, which Logan, was funny. Yeah. That Ryan Reynolds was in it, and we just knew it's like we know he's Deadpool, but they can't say he's Deadpool because it's Fox. Like it was, it was yeah. crazy. But he was doing everything Deadpool does. For me, well, I saw the old Color Purple as a kid, and mm -hmm. I kind of used to like it. But then as I got older, I kind of didn't like it, and I definitely don't have any plans to see the new one. <laughs> just because nobody asked for a, a remake of. of that it's movie. not a remake though. It's, it's, it's like the musical. It's like the Broadway oh, okay. version. Yeah. Yeah. It makes sense, I guess. But hmm. I know for me, what movie is coming out? Um, I actually want to see Book of Clarence. That seems interesting. Last year was a lot of good ones. Uh, Creed 3 was good. Oh, yeah. Very I really good. liked that um, one, too. Yeah, that was, that was good. It was. Actually, even though I feel like I knew what type of agenda it was pushing, I actually did like the Barbie movie. I think it was cool. What type of agenda was it pushing? It was pushing one of the things where it's trying to make that, and don't get me wrong here, but it was one of those, I I really didn't like it because it was like, oh, Ken came out here and then he did all this crazy stuff and now <laughs> the Ken don't know how to function uh, nothing and then now the women got to take back control. I think they could have showed balance yeah, because it, it actually didn't. In all aspects, it did the opposite. It made it feel like Ken didn't know what he was here for without being by Barbie. Like, yeah. But I mean, all in all, it was for adults. I think it was. I think it was cool because most little girls played with like Barbie dolls. So, yeah, they remember that. Yeah, some of the, some of the references were were cute and cool, but 
Yeah, I, I've, I've been hearing, like, the other side of things. Like, a lot of people feel like Ken was too centered in the movie, period. But They made Ken be I, – I, I, I expected him to go a different way, but I know Ken was going to be pretty much the antagonist yeah. <laughs> of, of the movie. Like, that was wild to me. I thought it mm-hmm. was going to be – see, one of my favorite movies – from childhood, I'm gonna tell you, I got like a lot of movies that I can watch like I never seen them before. Clueless. Oh wow! You ain't expect me to say that one, did no. you? <laughs> I love Clueless. I used to watch. I'm a little older than you, so I used to watch the Clueless series before school. Okay. It had, like it had episodes. It was pretty good because they had all the same actors except for they had a couple times people changed. So Clueless, I can watch Selena like I've never ever. Oh. <laughs> seen it before like I love that 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 started well I don't really have to love no more but that's how like J-Lo used to be my crush like J-Lo I used to love some J-Lo just from Selena anything for Selena <laughs> this bumper <laughs> oh my, <laughs> my movies right there uh, everybody heard me say this before but Major Pain it's like one of my favorite movies okay School of Rock really it's anything like upbeat like yeah that's like just like I can watch with the kids or mm-hmm. whatever, but also like anything that kind of like reminds me of like the '90s and like good childhood stuff. That's that's yeah. what I really like about like all those all those movies. Mm-hmm. And there are, there are countless others that I probably used to watch like that. I know life. I know life like the like I can do it word for word. That's like that's the movie right there. Life. Okay. Life probably like hands down like the funniest movie. Mm-hmm. But y'all didn't come here to hear us talk about movies. Um, welcome back to the Texture Talk Podcast. Well, I'm your host, HD. If you're listening on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or any other streaming service, please like the podcast. Leave us a review so it helps us out with the podcast algorithm. And if you're currently watching us on YouTube right now, you know what to do. Hit the thumbs up, subscribe, hit all so you can be notified when I'm dropping all content. It's episode 114. And this is the first live episode, well, live in person episode of 2024. And so, you know, I'm back to drop some pressure today. And today we have our guest, Makaya, with us. Hello, hello. Makaya G. And she's all the way from, well, from Florida. And then she's also from Gary, Indiana. But I, I thought this would be a good episode to, to bring her in because she's new to the field. And she's pretty much a recent graduate. And I know a lot of people that watch my content are not necessarily people that's in their mid career or senior level. And they always want to hear from people who are just got in or what challenges and stuff that they faced in their career. So in this episode, those are some of the things we're going to address and hopefully you'll leave enlightened from the things that you hear. Makaya has to say, but Makaya, how you doing today? I'm doing well. Can't complain. Can't complain. How about yourself? I'm good. I'm actually enjoying this weather. You are. Yeah. Nobody was on the road. Okay. <laughs> That's true. That I got true. here super fast. I stay in Aubrey. I got here fast. Okay. Yeah, I stay in Addison. Took about 15, 17 minutes to get over here on the toll road. Do you stay? Never mind. It's too high level. I forgot you in cybersecurity. But I'll just say I used to like, I didn't stay in Addison, but I stayed close enough to it a while back. And I used to always go to a village on the parkway. So I was either at Yard House uh-huh. or um, Sidecar or the other one that people go to stir. Oh, stir. I haven't been to the stir in Addison, but I've been to the one downtown or in Deep Ellum. Um, but I've been to Village on the Parkway, like to at AMC. Mm-hmm. Um, and they got that cheese popcorn. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and a couple of the restaurants over there. But um, I like Addison. It's a, it's a cute, cool area. Um, I've been wanting to venture out maybe, but I haven't even been here for a year yet. So I think I... I think I want to explore that area a little bit more before I branch out. But I've been looking at Bishop Arts, okay. Oakland. Oh, so you want to be in the you want to be in the middle of everything. <sighs> That's the thing. I really don't like. I like how Addison's out the way. It's quiet. I feel super safe over there. Um, I like. I, I always know. say it's a good medium because it's not that far from down here. It's not. So it's like if you want to come, you can just come. Like when one of my friends, when she used to stay in Uptown. And I, we want to do something. I'm like, bet, hey, I'm, I'm finna come drive down, and yeah. I just park at they spot, and then we get active. Yeah, and it's yeah, that's true. I because I have friends that stay over in this area, um, but also more in like DFW or like Allen or McKinney. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, I'm like the middle point for everybody. So that's true. So I'm getting them spam text messages talking about oh your USPS package. Y'all got to try I've harder. I've been getting that too. Y'all got to yeah, try harder. Too. Aura, I'm gonna 
put these people on the thing so y'all can block them. But <laughs> can you go ahead and just introduce yourself for the, the guests and kind of just give them a background of who you are? Okay, well, I'm Micaiah. I'm originally from Gary, Indiana. Um, fun fact, my birthday is Leap Day, and it's a leap year, so I'll finally be turning six. Um, I went to school in Tampa, Florida at the University of South Florida, graduated with my BS in cybersecurity, uh, well, actually information security, and a minor in French, and moved to Dallas last June to start my career. Interesting. So we're definitely going to get into that. I want to dive into you leaving high school, going to college. Was information systems the major you knew you were going to go into leaving from college? No. I mean, leaving from high school, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, it wasn't. Um, so I knew I had an interest for tech, but I more so knew that I didn't want to do anything in the medical fields. Like, that's not really my thing. Um, wasn't really into law. So it was kind of like, okay, tech sounds cool. And that my interest sparked because my senior year of high school, actually, um, I took a web development class, even though it's not, you know, what I'm doing now, but like learning CSS <laughs> and like, I don't know, just the fact that you can write something and it does something like that right there, like was like, whoa. So, um, but I had a strong love for like cultures. I'm Puerto Rican and um, I was taking AP French in high school. So I was like, okay, I want to do something like with culture. So my first major when I was a freshman was actually international business. Um, but I looked a little closer at the curriculum and saw that I had to take business calc. So I dropped it <laughs> like a month later and switched to IT. And then my sophomore year um, is when my school opened up cybersecurity as a new major. It wasn't even a major when I first started. So they opened cybersecurity as a brand new major. It had all the same prereqs as IT, um, but the electives and the higher level classes were different. So I switched over my sophomore year and then graduated with that. Okay, I got a couple questions for you, but what, what college did you go to again? University of South Florida. Okay. And what's, what's y'all... Oh, Bulls, okay. Yeah. Bulls. yeah I thumbs down y'all in, yeah. in the chat and put what the Tech Bulldogs. <laughs> and like Tech Bulldogs. Man. Mm. That's my undergrad. Oh, okay. But, so I got a lot of questions for you. So, number one, well, you're you're Gen Z, right? Yeah. It's not a bad thing. No, it's, no. <laughs> I only say that because on Twitter, it's like they're running joke how y'all didn't experience what we experienced with MySpace. But that's the okay. That's why I hesitate because it's like I feel like the two thousands, baby, we're like right on the cusp. Like I, I remember MySpace. I wasn't old enough to like have it, <laughs> but the, I remember MySpace. We, I didn't grow up. We, we weren't like iPad kids. There wasn't really that. I didn't have a phone or anything like that. So, but yeah, what were you saying about MySpace? No, well, so MySpace to update your profile, you can go in there and you could change all the code so you can hide stuff, do all these different oh, things. Yeah. So a lot of people were doing some sort of web development programming back then. They didn't know it. They just wanted to make their page look good. Mm -hmm. So that's why I brought that up. It is, I will say, like, I think there's like the end part of like, so I have Gen Z siblings. My sister being the youngest born in 08. Then my oh. baby brothers are in 04 and 05. So they very much kind of grew up like you, but then different, like, they did have like little tablets and stuff, mm -hmm. but for the most part, while I was there, it still was like, no, we, we used to go rent movies from the library at that time. Well, uh, at that time when they were small, it was actually like DVDs, but mm -hmm. when I was coming up, we would rent movies. Like I honestly, I'll be wanting stuff to like go back. Like people, Redbox had, you know, that run where everybody's going to Redbox. Mm -hmm. I would love and it wouldn't be a lot of money in it, but if somebody could do it, I would love for somebody to get a movie rental place where you come pick up popcorn and you bring the mm -hmm. kids and y'all go find movies so you can watch them. It was just a, I mean, in a sense, it's a way to spend time. Yeah. That's what it was. I think now everything is so accessible. Exactly. A lot of the kids are not patient at all. Like, they want no. it now. And yeah. that's how, like, my kids are like that. They can watch anything. My little girl loves Boss Baby. She's been watching Boss Baby <laughs> Every day for like the last two weeks, like she that loves so Boss funny. Baby. <laughs> like I ain't gonna lie, it's a little funny movie. I had never watched it till I sat down and watched it with her. Uh -huh. I see why she like it, but I was like, "Come on now, like, like Boss Baby can't be this good." <laughs> and surprisingly, Telly Tubbies. Oh, okay. It's on that Netflix. 
It is. Yeah, Teletubbies is on Netflix. I never liked like the old school. Like they didn't remake it. They might added some stuff to remaster it, but oh. pretty much same thing. Oh wow, that that reminds. That's funny that she rewatches that movie because um, my mom told me I did the same thing with Lilo and Stitch. That was the movie that I watched multiple times in a day every day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But now let's to get back into you picking. In, well, you could say management information system, CIS, they're all the same thing to me. Mm-hmm. How do you feel about, well, since you said technically like you did the web development class and then you switched that major, I feel like most people go to college for the first year and then switch that major. Yeah. It's because you're asking an 18-year-old to pick something they're going to do for the rest of their life. Mm-hmm. And it's so much that get into our career field and decide to just do something different. So mm-hmm. I think that's pretty hard and to ask them to do. But how, what do you feel about that program? Like, what was, like, your curriculum like? Um, cybersecurity? Yeah. Oh, so you did, I know you said you did CIS. So did, did you start minoring in cyber? No, so I did I did international business, then I switched to IT, and then I switched to cybersecurity. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's, so how, so did you do any, I know you said once you, the next year they had, you were in information systems, but then they had cyber for the major. Mm-hmm. Did you do anything in information systems, or you switched right to cyber? Um, it was all like prereq. So there okay. was, um, I think like programming fundamentals, um, which was Java. We, so we learned Java, um, and then C and it was the same for cybersecurity. So those credits just like switched right over. So when it came to the higher level classes that were more specialized, like ethical hacking or, um, um, object oriented programming, that was specific to the cybersecurity major. So, um, I didn't really do. I'm not sure what the what the curriculum for IT would have been, mm-hmm. um, but the cybersecurity major was just more specialized for sure. More about the theory, really. Okay, cool. So let me ask you this: When you picked the major of cybersecurity, did you have an idea of what your end goal doing cyber was? It was just I want to be in cybersecurity. I had no clue. Like. I didn't really know anything about cybersecurity when they opened the major. It just sounded cool. And uh, I mean, I was one of those people that thought, oh, like, oh, I could be a hacker, like wearing the gray hoodie and the binary code going on. Mm-hmm. So I, it just sounded cool. Um, so I had no clue what to do um, until honestly my senior year, which in my opinion was way too late. Um, and I was going through a period really hard in my junior year where it seemed like all of my peers were like miles ahead of me. Like they, they knew they wanted to be pen testers. They were good at it. Um, and I just could not figure out how, how did they get here? We all have the same classes. I remember these people from two years ago. Um, how did they develop so far? Um, so that my senior year is when I really like buckled down and was like, okay, like, let me find my niche. Let me find what I want to do. Um, and I'm honestly still figuring that out. Um, this is my first, the job I have now is my first job in the field. Um, and it's kind of like a rotational program. Mm-hmm. So, which is really good. I love that I can do that, like f- spend a few months in a department and see if I like it. And then at the end of the program, I get to choose which one I want to go in. So right now I'm doing digital forensics, um, which is cool. I don't know any, I didn't know anything about digital forensics. That wasn't part of the curriculum. Yeah. I think it was an elective. Yeah. Um, we'll get there. We'll get oh, there. Okay. <laughs> I didn't want you to give him too much sauce in the beginning. Yeah. <laughs> but because you remind me of something that most people struggle with, at least people of color. Are you a first gen graduate? Yes. And I always ask that because it always like the numbers and everything you say, but the first gen graduates do well enough, but most of the time not on a level like you said, some of your peers. Mm-hmm. Because nine times out of ten, they had mentors that either had a, a, like a, a frat or something, or they had people that were helping them say, hey, do this, this and this. Like my, my baby brothers. Right now, he's telling me about some class he's got that's going to get him A plus or whatever. I said, that's cool. But I've been telling him for the last beginning of the year, hey, get your uh, certified cloud practitioner from AWS. Yeah. When I was in school, I ain't have anybody. Mm-hmm. So now I say, hey, I told another, say, you got to learn outside of school. Did you just do stuff in class or did you try to learn stuff outside of it? I honestly just did stuff in class. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I'm saying that, and I'm only doing this now because a lot of people are, are geared to go to college, but they don't understand in this field, it's different than other fields. It's, yeah. Your curriculum is okay. It's like a foundation. 
unless like they're giving you, and I has some things that I presented to like my past college because I saw like their curriculum was still bad. There has to be things where it's more so you're working on in class that gives you to what you would do at a job versus you teaching me all this theory, which is fine. Yeah. Theory is fine, but how does that help me do good on the interview? Which I made a video with my podcast episode from last week was about how Gen Z struggles at the job and struggles in interviews. Mm -hmm. And they were getting on Gen Z, but I was like, no, it's the school's fault. Cause I was like, even when I was in school, I took this business comm class, but sure they did my resume, but it wasn't really a tech resume. They didn't really show me how to interview. Yeah. I didn't have a lot of jobs lined up afterwards because I didn't know how to apply myself. I just was going to school. So I was like, you can't get mad at them. You told them to go to school, but you didn't prepare them for after school. And that's one of the trends I know. And that's how I can point out a bias when they're trying to be biased toward Gen Z. Mm -hmm. I was like, and number two, all your old people just need to go retire because y'all don't relate to us. Yeah. And I was like, I mean, yeah, I'm a millennial, but even like you said, you're born in the year, I guess, 2000 mm -hmm. or 2000 babies. So there are still things that overlap in between us to where we are still similar in some ways. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I don't like being micromanaged. I don't like you always being all up on me. I like to just let me know what I need to do and, and do it. And we also don't like the disrespect. The disrespect y'all used to be able to do to everybody else, that ain't going to fly. Mm -mm. Or you won't see us. Because they say it's like, oh, we don't believe you know, Gen Z is loyal. Of course we ain't loyal. Inflation been high every every year. Why yeah. would we be loyal to y'all? Exactly. People got families and mouths to feed. Mm -hmm. Y'all be loyal to us, we'll be loyal to you. I was doing a vlog on the way here, and I just was talking about how the, the girl from Cloudflare went viral mm -hmm. about when she got let go. And... It wasn't her manager. It was somebody from HR, somebody she'd never met before. It's like outsourced. And I was talking about like the CEO responded to that and was talking about, well, we let like 40 people go, but we still have like over a thousand plus salespeople. And so he just looked at it as a numbers game. And that's why I tell people all the time, I'm telling you now, younger in your career, it's always a numbers game to them. It's not that yeah. you got to take care of your family. It's not you got to take care of yourself or you may have bills or you may be helping your own family. And I always tell people that's young and say, hey, Look out for yourself, network, mm -hmm. always stay ahead of the game, pay attention to the company financials so you can make sure you're ahead of the game. Yeah. Thanks. But Thanks. back to your, your schooling. At least some of the languages that you learn are still on job descriptions. Like they were teaching, mm -hmm. they were teaching us visual basic and you don't see that on no job descriptions, <laughs> no mm -hmm. job descriptions. Mm -hmm. But I remember when we first talked, you talked about that you did get a chance to do some internships, right? Yeah. Let's talk about that because one advantage, well, actually, and we may get here later, but you're, I'm pretty sure you're on TikTok mm -hmm. and you see all the discourse about you ain't got to go to school. You ain't got to go to school. Yes. While I agree, you don't have to go to school, but when you look like us, you should go to school and it can help you get an internship. And I say school can only help you in the long run. Yeah. So I tell people, hey, if you can't go get your feeder role, get them to pay for school and go to school, get your degree, because you're going to have to be good regardless. And you don't have the luxury because we don't own or not in charge of a lot of hiring decisions to put you on. Mm -hmm. So you got to do what you got to do to make yourself stand out. Exactly. And now a lot of people are just whatever they see on social media, they're doing the same thing. So a lot of people don't stand out anyway. So you got to figure out how you're going to stand out. Exactly. I agree. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about what, what internships did you do? Um, so I actually only did one internship for three years, which I mean, at that point, is it even an internship anymore? But um, I actually was just an IT help desk intern for three years. That that was my internship while, while I was in college. OK, was that at a was it like through the college or was it like a, a like a major company or what? Um, I. I would, it was a company I was contracted with the Department of Defense. Um, they build simulations for the Air Force. And I just found it randomly on Indeed and applied and got the interview the very next day. Um, so I was very fresh in college when I got that job. I was stunned that I landed it. Um, and it was cool, but it was also, I, it was very stagnant. I didn't yeah. feel like I was learning anything at all. You was in GovTech, though. Huh? Technically, you was in GovTech. I guess so. Technically, I was. Did you have yeah. to get a clearance for it or no clearance? No, no, because okay. I was only just the intern. So, got you, got you. Yeah. I'm surprised. 
So what, and I'm, we're going to drive this home though, but what type of, if you can remember type of things that you do at the help desk that you think possibly have helped you currently in your career that anything that you took away from doing help desk or let me ask you this <laughs> because my channel is designed to also show the real behind some things. Mm -hmm. There are internships where they say you are an intern, but you're not actually doing work. You just there. Was this a job where you were just there? I was just there. And it was mainly just tickets. And most of the tickets that came through, I couldn't even work on because I didn't have like the access, access or the authority to do it. So it, it kind of was more like clerical work. So that's why I made that face because it, yeah. it didn't do anything, honestly. It, I mean, it looked good on a resume. And um, maybe I could have utilized. And that's another thing. College. I don't I'm not I don't know if that's like the college fault or my fault, but I didn't really utilize the resources around me. I could have networked at that job and talked to people in the cyber because there was a cybersecurity department. I could have networked through there, but um I I I didn't do that. I didn't take advantage of it. So um <clears throat> in that sense it really it didn't help me too much. Yeah. Honestly. Maybe my soft skills, but that's it. Right. But I mean, you wouldn't know to do that. Yeah, exactly. You don't know what you don't know, so I don't want you to, to feel bad for that. I mean, it's things out years ago I, I could have did differently. I, I didn't know. Mm -hmm. you just, you're just out there winging it yeah. for the most part. Yeah. And the opportunities were a little different back then. Now, I tell people, I tell my brother in all the time, it's like, bro, just go ahead and do these things. I'll try to help you find something, whether it's remote or whatever, because if you can get experience, because I was like, you know what? One of my brother's grades probably ain't going to be the best to get an internship. But I was like, if you had the skills, they can't deny you. You'll get you a, like an entry-level role so you can just be finishing school while you're already working. I was like, that's the goal. I'm trying to get y'all to where y'all will pass me in y'all early career and not have to be do what I did the first couple of years. Yeah, it is, it's so crazy. That, now that you said that, that's so true. Like, internships required so much, like, just to even get an interview, like you have to have over like over a 3.0 GPA. Um, the job I have now, there was nothing of that sort. So it was harder to get an internship. Well, in my experience, I know it. No, no, most probably, people is. Yeah, it was harder to get an internship. That was my only internship. It was harder to get in internships in school than it was to get interviews with actual jobs for full-time positions. Yeah, and most people, I don't know if you knew this, but a lot of people get those internships by their network. Mm-hmm. So last year, working at one of the companies I worked for, it's a bigger company, it's a bigger financial company. I remember when the intern, not last year, the year before that, when all the interns were there, like gobs of interns. Mm -hmm. I was like, man, J.P. Morgan got a lot of interns here. And I was like, so either they applied or they know some people. And that's something, too, that people don't know. Just apply. Like you said, you saw the job on Indeed and you applied. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's all they take to find an internship is applying, and you may or may not be successful. The worst thing they could tell you is no. Mm -hmm. Rejection will happen. Uh, most of the time, it's going to be a lot of rejections before you get a yes. Yes. So you do the, we'll say, the I was just there internship. Mm -hmm. So the, the last time that you do that internship was, uh, we'll say, I guess the last time going back into your senior year. What, I guess, changed then when you said, okay, I'm about to get out of school. What am I going to do because I want to get a job? What were So what did you decide to do that was going to help you get a job after school? Okay, yeah. So I had joined um, a white – there was a there was a club at my school called um, – oh, my gosh, I forgot the name, White Hatters. It was like an ethical hacking <laughs> – <laughs> like an ethical hacking, hacking club. Um, and that really is what pushed me um, because I was comparing myself to everybody else that was in the club. Like I said before, they were like miles ahead of me. Um, but I am very grateful for, for that club because it opened the door to a lot of things that I just did not know about. And that sparked my interest in cloud. So January of my in the year 2022, that's the year I graduated. January of that year, I decided I was going to study for my AWS Certified Cloud Practitioner, and I got it. <clears throat> and that really was, like, the momentum I needed to, like, keep going. So after I got that certification, I was like, okay, like, now I know I can I could probably apply myself. And um, so from there, 
I was just doing side things on my own, looking at YouTube videos um, of people talking about cybersecurity. I felt like time was running out because I was about to graduate. Um, and, um, unfortunately my mother passed, um, May of that year before I, before I could graduate. So she didn't get to see me walk across the stage. Um, and she wanted me to, she was my biggest fan and she always, always used to push me into like doing bigger things. But, you know, I was a rebellious teenager thinking she's <laughs> nagging me. So, um, I realized too late that, um, she meant well and that she had the right idea. So after that event, um, I just buckled down and like really applied myself. And so I did a, um, boot camp. It was like a free boot camp, um, for only like three months and through the boot camp, I, um, obtain my CompTIA cybersecurity analyst plus certification and that really was like what sealed the deal for me I, I credit the boot camp I mean of course boot camp was it it's called Perscolis um check it out it's, it's specifically for um people of color to help people of color get into tech uh, you don't have to have a degree it didn't cost any money but I was in school doing that at the same time so it was very tough um but I I do credit the boot camp with helping my cybersecurity career because like you said college was good and having a degree is what ultimately got me the job because it was required but uh it was just the theory that I was learning in college with the boot camp that's how I was getting my hands on experience um so yeah that year was really just grind time yeah. and then I I got my job offer a week before I graduated so yeah um what did I want to touch on? There was a lot that you said. First of all, about the, the cloud practitioner. Funny that you say that. In my Somebody tagged me in a TikTok, one of my, my friends, and he was asking me about some advice that uh, my guy Kyrie was giving. And he was advising people, the two certs he likes people to get is maybe Sec Plus and the cloud practitioner. And I was like, I agree with the cloud practitioner. I don't really agree too much on Sec Plus just because I'm indifferent about come to your certifications. Oh, <laughs> I actually like the Cyso Plus. I got that. Yeah. What twenty eighteen or something like that? I got it while I was working in the sock. So I actually like that one. I think it's a. I think it's at the time it was one of the best blue team certifications uh, until Security Blue Team came with mm -hmm. Blue Team Level One. Now, okay. if you are wanting to stay blue team and want to take your probably like your skills to the next level, I would probably highly suggest Security Blue Team. Okay. Because this is a practical certification. Mm -hmm. So unlike the memorization similar to whatever you've been doing, rotating at work, it's covering all those domains that you're like already doing now. So that'd be cool. Okay. Security blue team. But yeah, that was, that's cool that you, you got that certification. And I like, did you do the AWS one? Like, did you pick a certain course? Like for me, I found two instructors on Udemy and I just follow what they did. So they had me setting up stuff in the cloud and I was answering the, the practice test mm -hmm. and then helped out. Cause I needed, I was looking at the cloud, like S3 buckets and VPCs, and uh, instances through our sim all the time, but I didn't really know what I was looking at. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I need to learn something about the cloud. Yeah. So. Yeah, I learned through um, a cloud guru. Okay. I used him, and um, I think I also did, like, a Udemy course. Um, but I found the exam, like, not that hard it's to not, study for. The practice test was yeah. harder than the exam. Yeah. And I did want to follow, like, an AWS pathway. I still do. I just kind of put it off. Um, but I did, just, like, settle on a pathway of, like, AWS certs to do. Mm -hmm. So, like, I, I wanted to get um, the security professional one. Yeah. Um, so the path I was going to do was uh, the cloud practitioner and the solutions architect and then whatever came after yeah, that. Uh, especially security. Yeah. Um, I just only made it to the... Cloud practitioner, but I'll get back at it. Yeah. But like I said, that's that's still a good choice. And then mm -hmm. couple that with a degree in the SISA plus. That that's that's pretty good. A lot of people coming out of school would just have a degree or they may or may not have a certification. Like for me, I was like, my grades ain't good. And the mentor at the time was like, You should get your security plus because he worked for the government. So mm -hmm. they are big on come to you. And I got the security plus, but then it was like what next? Everybody has the security <laughs> plus. But now. see, back then, though, cyber, this is what? That's 10 years ago, yeah. Oh, okay. Well, actually, I graduated in November of 2013 from undergrad. So 
a little over 10 years, really, because then you had November, January, and it started 2014. I started working my help desk job in May of 2014. But back then, it was few and far between them, like, getting cybersecurity jobs. And mm-hmm. I was just had back then, and this is the reason why I tell people don't um, lie on your resume. I had, like, Nessus, <sighs> Linux, Wireshark. I had forgot stuff I had on there, but some of that stuff I couldn't really talk about in the interview. I just had it on there because one of my other mentors was like, hey, yo, throw this on your resume because he worked for uh, Accenture at the time. And that didn't really work out for me. And the reason why it didn't work out is because of my resume. I was showing, but I wasn't telling. So I didn't have any projects. I wasn't showing what I used Nessus for, what I used Linux for, what are the other things I knew how to do. But what I could have did, the reason why I asked you earlier about information systems, I did actually have this class where we had to design a network for a three-story building and what type of stuff we would use. That would have been a good project to talk about. We had a capstone where we had to do a system analysis and design, and we made like an inventory system for the bowling alley. Oh, wow. So I had some stuff I could have talked about. I just didn't know. And that's why I tell people, it's like, they didn't say, hey, talk about these projects and make sure you notate them down. Nobody in those classes helped me with that. Mm -hmm. And now when I talk to or do consults with people like yourself there in school or trying to transition, I was like, so what projects have you done? I was like, because you're going to have to show them something if you don't have any type of requisite experience. Exactly. And it's, I mean, it's hard to do. They always say, well, how do I find projects or whatever? So, but that's cool. So after the boot camp, how many jobs did you start applying to? I, like, countless. Uh, probably over 100. Okay. I was applying to jobs just to apply at one point because it was like if something has to land. I graduate in, like, two months, and I have no job prospects. And actually, after the boot camp, I went to um, a tech conference through my school, the Society of the Society of Perf- Hispanic Professional Engineers, Um um, and I even applied to jobs there. I interviewed with jobs on the spot. Um, nothing, I, I had a, a few offers, but it was more like IT help desk. And that's also what the boot camp pushed was IT help desk because it was geared towards people trying to get into tech. It wasn't meant for people who were already in college for it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I knew that my skills were beyond IT help desk. Like, the first interview, the first interview I did land, my first technical interview ever, um, was for an IT help desk position. Mm-hmm. And when it came down to the question of like, okay, so like, what's your salary range? I was going off of what I was making in college at the at the GovTech internship, uh, which was about I don't even know, I think around like twenty four dollars an hour, which was which was amazing. He was rich in college, <laughs> so I was comparing that to this position. So I, I, I gave them a range that probably was outside of the range of like a normal IT help desk position. I said 60,000 and he was like, no. Mm. (laughs) And he actually told me, um, you know, your resume is very impressive. You seem great. You're very smart. Um, but honestly you're, you're lucky to have gotten this interview as a woman. Wow. Yes. And that was my first ever technical interview. What was this? What was this person? He was palm colored. <laughs> and I felt like he wanted to say as a black woman. That's what I felt like he wanted to say. Um, and so after hearing that, I could have let that discourage me, especially with that being my first technical interview. My, you know, that was my first experience. But I knew what I had. I knew the skills that I had. And I knew my knowledge. And I, I knew that I could apply myself more. Uh, so I didn't let that discourage me. I went on more interviews after that. I landed more interviews. <clears throat> I really studied. I had like a, a cheat sheet of all these tech, random tech facts, like random lines of like Linux code. I, I mean, I was like prepared for anything an interview had to throw at me. Um, and then I landed this position at this job, which is um, an entry level cybersecurity position, which is what I knew I could do. Mm-hmm. So um, I'm glad I didn't let that deter me or else right. I, I wouldn't have been here. I want to talk about that, though. Mm hmm. I've like I get a lot of flack a lot of times because you all are my primary guest women especially women of color and it's a reasoning these are the type of stuff that they go through and he probably felt he can get that off because you was young and you mm-hmm. felt like you was naive mm-hmm. now in future references if somebody ever say that you should say you should be lucky I accepted the interview with y'all 
Because how are you going to tell me that? But I only tell you that is because I've worked for some prominent Fortune 500. Matter of fact, they were probably Fortune 50 companies. One of these companies at the time told somebody that I should have been happy that I was working there. Who am I to leave? They didn't say it to my face. They knew they didn't say that to my face because I was going to tell them something. Mm-hmm. So they feel like that. Oh, you should be happy not knowing that, hey, whatever this is paying, I've already made more than this anyway. You're really wasting my time, which is why I teach clients now, hey, get the range before you even get on the phone. Hopefully they give it to you. If not, I'm passed. If it's something I don't like, but it may fit somebody else's range, I'll send them to pe- people I know and help them get interviews or something like that. But I don't waste time with that if it's not in my range. Mm-hmm. And if they ever tell me I'm lucky, no. Y'all look at how great y'all with my presence. Yeah. I'm the catch here. And he still had the, the nerve to offer me the position. I Obviously, I declined it because it was it was the principle of the things at that point. Um, I think you should have reported him, though. He shouldn't. Be, I did. Yeah. I did. Hopefully he got fired. Um, he They were... I don't, I really don't even, they, the company was, um, partnered through the boot camp, So I told my mentor at the boot camp what they said. Um, so I don't know what happened beyond that, but they were very, um, upset for me that that was said to me. So I'll be upset too. I'll be type person to apply to a job just to talk to him. <laughs> yeah. Just pull up on the Mark Bird, man. Put some respect on my name. Yeah. You understand me? It's like I was on a mission to like prove not not to just to myself that I could do it, but to prove him wrong. Even though of course he would have never known I landed where I did, but I felt like spiritually he would know <laughs> that I proved him wrong. So And we will not be mentioning any company names to protect you mm-hmm. and protect this interview from not going down. With that being said, when did you, so your role, you said it's an entry-level role and it's a rotational program. Mm-hmm. So how many, so what was the first rotation that you did? Incident response. Okay. Let's talk about that because I love IR. You do. IR is, is a rush. It's, especially, it depends too, like if you're in a place where like something comes in and, and like the soccer something can't handle it, like it's perfect. Mm-hmm. So was your IR set up like, I don't know if you guys had like maybe either internal sock or outsource sock or you guys work with the sock and then, or you work as a sock and do IR. Like how was the IR set up for you? Um, it may be the case in other locations with the company, but um, here in Dallas, the Dallas office is very, very small. Like the cybersecurity team as a whole, there's probably only about a dozen of us. Wow. Yeah. Very lean. Yeah. So um, there was, there's none of the, outsourcing or like it is literally like just us. okay so yeah so it's like a uh, it's like a fire team then i guess mm-hmm. it's like everything's like together mm-hmm. so how was that experience for you um honestly it was it was better than what i i don't i don't really know what i was anticipating but um i think having like a a smaller team that's my more close-knit um worked out it can i mean it's a double-edged sword because you have people that don't really ever come into the office. So then you're like kind of, I've been in there alone sometimes. Um, but I think it built the connections more. Like my coworkers, all of them are like my mentors. They have no problems helping me with a problem or a question. And I think that may have been harder to achieve at a location where the office is like a lot larger. Uh, because with the program, we all we all start at the same time, like everyone else who's on the rotational program. Um, and I talk to them in the different locations. Like I, I have, um, friends in the Chicago office or in the Boston office. And, um, it just seems like their experience is different. Everyone's having a good experience, but it seems like that one-on-one and like strong connection build isn't, isn't as present in the bigger locations. Okay. Mm -hmm. And you probably answered this already, but. Do you feel that being hybrid has actually helped you out early on in your career versus just being straight remote? Because we see a lot of young, I don't want to say kids, I'm sorry, young adults, Mm -hmm. they want to be remote. But, and this comes from a person that, of course, yeah, I was doing the help desk like my first couple of years. However, we were always in office. So you are able to put the call on mute. Go tap on somebody's shoulder and ask them something. Mm-hmm. Or when I was got my first couple of sock jobs, we was all there in person. Or, well, some of the team was remote, but they were always quick to respond. But you can get more growth that way. And not only that, I'll put you on a little secret. I talk about this all the time. Visibility. 
you get visibility sometimes when the leaders come through and they see oh, that yeah. you're at the office. Mm -hmm. And some people don't know that because they a lot of people think that if I'm very good at my job and I just work and go home, that means I will get the promotion. I'm here to tell you that is not true. So I'm here to tell you that, hey, that sounds good, but you're going to have to network. You're going to have to be visible so people can know who you are. And you got to be your biggest champion on things that you've accomplished. Mm -hmm. But I wanted to ask you about that, just working uh, that's helping you out. And at a high level, can you talk about anything like any new things that maybe you learned about cyber that you possibly that school or the boot camp didn't prepare you for? Um, yeah, so, well, first I 100% agree with the hybrid aspect. Um, yeah, it's nice to work from home, but being in person was really the only way I learned how to use the tools that we use. Like there was, there would be no way that a Zoom call would have helped me be able to learn these tools that I've never heard of before, never seen of before, especially when it, since now I'm on digital forensics, especially when it comes to digital forensics, like there would have just been no way. So it, to answer your question of like what I've learned um, literally everything. <laughs> uh, I've learned what digital forensics is, what it meant. I learned like what all goes on in incident response, not even just like the technical aspects of things, but um, the the teamwork aspect yeah. of it. Communication part of it is yeah. the big one. Hey, do we have what we need? What's the update on this? Mm -hmm. Who we need to leak? Uh, who we need to link into this incident? Mm -hmm. Because what you what a lot of people don't even know is a lot of times. The breach ain't even on your company. It's a company that you work with <laughs> that's got an incident. And now y'all checking them now, making sure none of y'all data is at play. Like, what type of effect does it have on you? Like, these are all the things that you have to worry about. And considering, like, all the breaches that happen, like, every week that I'm reading about. Yeah. It's always something small. I want to ask you, because we'll get on uh, the DR side real quick. Mm -hmm. I mean, well, DF part of uh, DFIR. But when you were doing incident response, what tools were you using? Um, so we, we were using, um, like, well, I don't know if I say ring a bell, but like Axiom, X-Ways, um, we had, there's a tool that one of my coworkers actually developed that we use called Velociraptor, or he helped develop it, Velociraptor, um, ASDF, but that's another thing I wanted to say was that, at, I'm sure it's different across different companies, but with this company, um, the incident response, like the stuff we, the stuff I was doing with incident response is the exact same stuff I'm doing in digital forensics. It's a little different, but yeah. we're using the same tools. It's a lot of, it's a lot of overlap. I think the only yeah. difference is for digital forensics, you probably have a little bit more time about um, really doing the analysis of yes. whatever the memory or, or something you is, because it could take a while to mm -hmm. get all that and really look through those registries and those processes seeing exactly what's going on. But mm -hmm. it's a skill set. I think I was telling you that when we first met, I was like, you learning digital forensics is, is a bag. It's a niche bag. Like <laughs> everybody don't know forensics. I promise you. No. Yeah. I'm just like learning some other things about forensics. And that's pretty like cool. Like one of my weaknesses about why I didn't get one role was like, Hey, I have a, a weakness with forensics specifically when it comes to Linux. Mm -hmm. So if you can learn Linux, then you already know how to do forensics for that Windows and any other operating system. And then not let alone, you know, how to do forensics for the cloud. You're good to go. Yeah. So th those are the things like when I'm talking to people, I am trying to tell them, I'll say, I, I know you're trying to go chase the money and which we haven't even talked about that yet, which I need to ask you because uh -huh. I really, I rarely, sometimes if, if I know I need to make the money a focal point of the episode, I'll bring it up. But a lot of times I'm just telling people about, hey, just enjoy the ride. Mm -hmm. like we talked a couple of episodes ago. I was just telling people how like back in back in my day, <laughs> <laughs> back in my day, it, all this one going on. You just got yeah. your head down and you enjoying the journey. You tunnel vision. If you remember that even that right now, you'll be fine mm -hmm. because you're I found you from Twitter. So you see like, of course, like some people maybe I interact with or some people that you follow from afar, mm -hmm. the type of lives that they're living or type of things they're doing, places they're going. You'll get there. It's just your time to put the work in because yes. they definitely didn't start out like that either. And then like Marquita said, like a lot of them either contractors doing some are doing C to C some just, you know, are overemployed, you know, mm -hmm. it is what it is, but you'll get there. But a lot of people are trying to, it's not common, at least in cyber to be able to do that when your first role and mm -hmm. some people are doing it, but they're not really ex excelling anything. Like my advice to you right now is like, Hey, 
from here on out, and I don't know if you've been doing this or not, I don't know if you have a mentor or not, you can consider me your unofficial mentor. It's like okay. anything that you do, big or small, that you help with at that company now, you write it down. Yeah. Everything. That's actually how I landed the role. Um, someone who worked at the company found me on Twitter, and I was doing what you said. I was just documenting random stuff that I was working on. Mm-hmm. I kind of had gave up on the not I don't want to say gave up but the way I am as a person I'm very much like go with the flow and if I feel like something is I kind of just leave it up to God or the universe to like let things work out so I had started to just talk about the stuff I was doing the search that I was studying for uh, little home projects I had I would just tweet about it randomly put on my LinkedIn and someone was watching me the whole time keeping up with my tweets and keeping up with my journey the whole time and DM'd me said, Hey, um, the work that you've been doing is like very impressive. I want to refer you to the job, to the, to the, to the company I work at. And then I ended up get the job. So I tell my friends, um, or anyone that asks me for advice, I tell them all the time, like talk about what you do, document your journey, work on independent projects because that's really what's going to sell you. Like you can get the certs, but really the certs, at the end of the day, just prove that you know how to study and pass the test. Companies care about the hands-on and how you apply what you're learning. So um, that's what I did. So I think you're spot on with that. That's how I got my job. Yeah, no, I'm just, audience, this is like the third <laughs> or fourth person that, that told you they was documenting stuff. And you saying you're documenting your stuff on Twitter actually reminds me of Dayspring. When he was de- a document, well, he already has his YouTube document stuff, but he's also talking on Twitter. And I want to say that's how he got his job at Datadog at the time. Mm. He's no longer he's no longer there. But any social media you're on, let them know what your expertise is and what you're working on. Like you just never know, because a lot of people know. are doing it backwards. They'll try to get referrals from people they never said two words to. Exactly. Now some people will say sure, because they maybe just want the money. I'm not giving you a referral if I don't know who you are, because mm-hmm. you're gonna be a reflection of me. So I have to at least know you a little bit, what your goals are, what you even know before I decide to refer you. Mm -hmm. And so that's a little bit, a tidbit of advice for y'all as well. It's like, stop just trying to get referrals from people. Stop. It's a lot of people on LinkedIn telling people, hey, give these people referrals. No. Mm -hmm. (laughs) (laughs) Well, I'm going to refer somebody I don't know. You can make me look horrible. They'll never take my referees again. Mm -hmm. One of my last companies, like I referred so many people because I did a lot of good work. My referees did good work. So I was good anytime I needed to refer people. They was always getting jobs. So that's a big thing. Certain people only refer people. I've been referred to jobs from my peers. Uh, well, at their companies because they're killing it. And they interview me. And I was like, oh, no wonder he's killing it because they're killing it. Mm-hmm. And that's how it goes. That's the other thing I've been talking about some of my, my, with my clients or something like this. Like building that outside of your social media following and all that your internal circle of network of people that do different things in the industry. That's how you stay ahead. That's how if they're elevating and you're elevating, yeah. Hey, I'm going to take over this director role at such and such company. I know you already need, to, I know you need to do this. They give me like full leeway to build the team out. I want you to come over here. You name your price. Mm-hmm. That type of stuff happens. You know how I know it happens. Most of these CISO, C-level people go from company to company. Everybody just friends and they start bringing up people they know. Mm-hmm. They'll get rid of teams and bring in their own team that they want. Mm. Happens all the time. Yeah. And people don't pay attention to that. But here's something I had wanted to ask you about that I had on the thing. And I figured it'd be good. Now we can do a little segue into it. Okay. What's your what's your morning routine for going into the office? <laughs> well, the days that I do actually go into the office, um, I wake up, I do a little bit of stretching. Um I might eat breakfast. Sometimes I don't. And um, I had, I like to go in on Mondays because I have to start my week on a productive note or else I'm not, it, the energy is just down for the rest of the week. So I like to go in on Mondays and Wednesdays. Um, I'm usually the only person there on Mondays, which is fine by me. Um, but yeah, that's how my day starts. I start my shift around nine um, in the day around four. Okay. Do you go get like anything like Starbucks or anything? Are you a tea girl, water girly? What type of girly are you? I'm definitely a tea girl. I like my chamomile tea with lavender. <laughs> That's my go to tea. Um now that it's cold, I might do the um the throat tea, the eucalyptus throat medicine. That's some chamomile tea. I got that, the lemon, the peppermint, mm. and something else. My go to right now is I got a I just bought a Nespresso machine. 
a couple of weeks ago. Oh, see, I I it's I, good. I'll drink coffee, but I'm I'm not a coffee drinker. Like the Nespresso's, they are because they only come in certain capsules. Mm. But they're good. Like you can make you an exquisite. Like I put up one up on my IG story a while back because I got some clear cups, so I want to show off some stuff mm-hmm. whenever I do uh, like a day in the life video, and it's fire. Maybe I'll get into it. Maybe I have to like grow up a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I definitely feel like an old man. When I have a mug with an H on it for my name, and oh. I have a subscribe mug too. But oh. I wanted to know if I could ask you this because you brought it up. We talked about salary a little bit. In this rotational program, what type of salary were you able to either negotiate or get? Um, so, unfortunately, I was so blown away by what they offered me that I didn't even negotiate. I just accepted right away. <laughs> um, the position, the intro-roll rotational program position um, starts at 90K. That's what I was offered. So being going from being turned down from 60K to being offered 90k off the jump was I was like yes I'll take it uh, looking back I probably definitely could have I should have negotiated I probably could have negotiated for something higher but I mean I'm a welfare baby <laughs> so like <laughs> the, the salary still changed my life I'm still very grateful I was gonna ask, gonna ask you about that I, yeah. that was me I went from at the knock I was making like 50,000 and my first sock position offered me, I think, all in all, I think I was getting like seventy eight thousand. Mm-hmm. So I was like, "Shoot, I'm up." Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I get a better apartment. Yeah. I had I had traded in the whip at the time and got a uh, a sedan because the the Mustang was drinking too much gas. Mm. I loved it, but it was drinking too much gas. Mm-hmm. But this is these are the real conversations I like to have because, like I said. Everybody not making ninety k. Yeah. If we do, if I pull up the analytics right now, everybody not making ninety k. Mm-hmm. Especially your age range, your demographic. You making, you're in the probably the top, what, five or what, fifteen percent or whatever of like women are making like money you're making because typically women making like forty some k or something like that. Mm. Yeah, and it's like of course like, like six figure salary is like everyone's dream goal. Um, but like this, I'm I'm living well. Like I can support yeah. myself and still do things for fun. I I live I live comfortably. And at the end of the rotational program, we do get like a promotion, like an increase. So, okay. did you get? Um, did they offer any like type of sign on bonus? Yes, five k sign on bonus. Um, because they have offices everywhere, and I chose to relocate from Florida, they did not give me a relocation package. Okay. So that I had to fully do. By so myself. what made you want to pick Dallas? Um, I just heard that. Well, not heard, but I, I did some research. There's this uh, website called CyberSeek. And yeah, CyberSeek.org. Yeah, and so I was I was just plugging in the places that I would like to go it was between this it was between dallas or dc and dc just seemed like way too big of a move from florida yeah. so um and i have an aunt that lives here so i had someone oh, okay. i had someone to kind of push the the dallas you know yeah. Where, uh, what part uh, does she stay in mckinney okay yeah so you sound like me my, when i moved out here i moved in with my aunt she stayed in little m oh okay yeah so um and i i just researched and um i've like of all the tech hubs Dallas was always on the list, not necessarily top of the list, but it was always on the list and it's booming now. Oh yeah. Yeah. So I think people are asleep. Like people thought <laughs> I'm going to be funny, but people thought Austin was that, how you say that girl, that girl. <laughs> yeah. They thought, they thought that's what Austin is, but it's really Dallas. It really is Dallas. No, same thing. I heard people were like, well, why not Austin? Austin probably has more opportunity. And I was like, I mean, Dallas seems more like the vibe and uh, companies are leaving Austin. Yeah. And people ask me all the time, well, why not Houston? And it's like, you know, I'm sure Houston's great. I've been to Houston, but um, I wanted to be around more like Dallas gives me like the more of like the young professional vibe. It is. You can still have the Houston, social you life. You go to go party. Yeah. You can still have the social life here in Dallas, but I wanted to be around like more goal or not. I don't want to say people in Houston aren't goal oriented. No, say it. But you know what? Uh, you know what I mean? Like Houston's like a good time. Houston reminds me of just a Texas version of Atlanta and Atlanta also has good opportunities, but I was not moving to Atlanta. So why would I move to Houston? Yeah. Yeah. So Dallas was just more my speed. It's it's slower. And that's more of 
that was more the vibe I wanted to go for. I, I've been in college for four years. I got the social life yeah. out the way. Yeah. I, I, I it's time for something. you different. saying that, because we'll, we'll get back on a professional tip. I do tell people that, I mean, we, we are in the times where people just say, well, bump school or just do WGU and then be finishing that. I do think going to school away from home is a pivotal part of your maturation process mm -hmm. as a young person yes. because you get to really discover who you are, things about yourself you didn't know while you're at home that were masked because you go to school, you're with your, your parents, different people you may or may want to interact with. You learn so much how to survive. Yeah. Like so much. I think a lot of people are missing a lot of their character development because they're not going to school. Mm -hmm. That might be a hot take. I might put that on there. It might be a hot take. I think a lot of people are missing that. <laughs> I mean, I agree. I agree. College definitely taught me, like, about the world around me, the people around me, about how other people are raised. Like, you don't, you, you were raised a certain way and you have certain values. College exposes you to how other people were raised and how other people um, val values develop, which is very important to navigate through life. Uh, so I would agree with you. College definitely is um, a catalyst for um, um, learning about others and yourself. So I would say that, too. Cool. Now we'll get back into. Even though you said you're doing a lot of. Actually, I'll ask you this, and then we'll go into forensics. In your definition, what would you define incident response as? So, to me, um, well, just from what I've been doing and my experience in it, um, incident response is more so focused on, like, I want to say, like, the recovery and mitigation of, like, when an attack happens. Mm -hmm. Um I, I'm naturally pairing it with digital forensics because that's <laughs> that's what I that's just how I'm experiencing. But the way it's different from digital forensics is, like you said, um, forensics is more so like um, analyzing the data. You have more time to analyze the data. Um, it's not so much like we'll give recommendations on what the company should do, but incident response is more focused on that, like the recovery. You gotta stop the bleeding. Like we yeah. find patient zero, we're gonna let. Um, the forensics team know, yo, we send this to y'all. We found patient zero. Mm -hmm. But I always liken it to like firemen and cops are first on the scene. So we're going to say those are the SOC analysts. Mm -hmm. Now we have the fire investigator. We had the detectives. We had the paramedics. And I may be missing people, but those are the incident responders because now they're coming to something. It's already been notified. Hey, this is an incident. We need this to this people mm -hmm. so we're doing the investigations or we are you know containing the host paramedics are stopping the bleeding all that stuff and then you know if the paramedic you take them to the hospital mm -hmm. the hospital's gonna be the forensics people they're gonna do the deeper dive on the patient yeah like a lot of times the cases that come through they've already been attacked and they've already done the stuff mm -hmm. a lot of times and this, i'm talking about the digital forensic side now yeah. a lot of times they just want us to make sure everything's like good or if there's anything else that we see or was there something that was missed or um sometimes a company we've there's been a company that's been attacked more than once like that happens all the time way more time like way more than i than i thought like oh, yeah. a company was like yeah we've had this happen to us back in july and it's like what or we've had this happen three times before so um sound like octa right there yes <laughs> so um that's that's what i've been getting a lot in the digital forensics when, on the incident response side it was more it was more active cases like um we just saw this come through over the weekend um or we were seeing really strange activity, like, can you know? So that that that's what the incident response side was more like. So yeah. yeah, that's cool. I tried to make it. That's one of the skills I think I developed by knowing my audience. Mm -hmm. I can take something that could somebody could explain it super technical. But I'm like, I'm gonna make this. You can't not misunderstand what I just said about the paramedics taking them to the hospital yeah. <laughs> for the deep dive from the doctors. Mm -hmm. You can't misunderstand that. What? So I I think I asked you this earlier, but. Like for me, I've dealt with uh, a myriad of, of different type of 
activity based on the industry too. You'll fear, find out in your experience based on the industry, the company you work for, you'll start seeing different attack types. Mm -hmm. So you may eventually get used to the stuff you're seeing because it's like, I'm used to all this. Yeah. Then you go to a different industry. It's like, ah, so their attack vectors are different because of, of this mm -hmm. or the way that they're confined because every company does not have everything set up to be as the network hardened as it should be mm -hmm. because as a lot of people's minds that like you can stunt creativity or we want you to be free. And so now you make your IR team in the SOC and forensics, you make the pen testing team. Everybody got to work harder because y'all don't want to do the foundational stuff we need to do to keep the place secure. So there are a lot of, a lot of things. And the crazy thing is, it's still the number one thing that always trips people up. It's not the technology. It's your people. That's the weak link. Mm. The sophisticated social engineering people are watching everything people do. They are, and they may not even go at you first. They may go to, I was watching a podcast. I forgot the name of it, but it was with, I want to say the guy was the C, the CISO or something of a uh, company, Abnormal Security. And he was talking about how the biggest trends that we actually see with attacks are not really super sophisticated attacks just yet. They are more so phishing, mm -hmm. but they don't initially kind of start off with sending you a link. They just send an email trying to get a conversation going with you. Yep. And he was talking about how one time the attackers knew that he used Navy Federal for his bank. So they reached out to his wife and like, oh, yeah, we're seeing all this. Blah, blah, blah. But the wife is leery of it. It's like, mm, this don't make sense or whatever. And the person sent the link. The link don't match up or whatever they send. Mm -hmm. But you got to think about it. It might not work on you. But somebody you know, they might say, oh, yeah, yeah. we see that you're friends. And you typically go here. We had something going on with the account. Just like the fake USPS stuff. That's trash. But people who are actually going to take time to make it look legitimate. Like, if you're going to try to like smish me through the text, like try to figure out the code they send me when they send to me like MFA. So you can make it look like you're the same people <laughs> if you're going to be smart, but you're not. Yeah. <laughs> but th like those are the things that I've been seeing too. Like phishing has like been the biggest one, like phishing mm -hmm. QR codes are, yeah. are getting people. Those are a lot of things like people sometimes it just won't slow down or they'll just pay attention to somebody that's a high profile. I'm like, Oh, I, I see that you guys are a merchant or a vendor. These people, we may just compromise the merchant to get y'all. Mm -hmm. Like, that's what they do. <laughs> They're not typically going at the big fish first. We're going to get them first. And then we're just going to keep on responding to you like everything good. Mm -hmm. That's when we're going to try to get you. Then we're going to try to exfiltrate your data from that way. Yep. That's how you That's how you do it. So all the stuff that we sometimes see that people do on the shows that we like to watch, that's what that was, comes over into uh, the digital world when it comes to cybersecurity. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've... I've I've been ha I've had cases um, that I've worked on. It was a whole range of that. It was the range of the QR codes, which, if I'm being honest, to the everyday person is very believable, especially when you're doing the MFA. Like, because um, these employees, when you sign into your computer, sometimes you have to send like a, a push notification. Mm -hmm. But um, the email that I saw that for a case we were working on, a BEC, business email compromise, mm -hmm. um, was with a QR code, and it was like, it was, it says, oh, we're, we're changing our verification. Um, use QR codes now. We're using QR codes now. And the person did it. So it's like, okay, that was one. And then, but we also, I've also seen ones where they were specifically crafted for a specific person. Like they even emailed, um, per, they emailed other people in the company pretending to be that person, referring to old emails from the past. Like, hey, can we have an update on this meeting and they would the person would respond with the updated and then it it would go into like more like yeah. questions that's like wait hold on a second let me let me make sure this is actually you because i feel like we've already talked about this before so yeah you see a whole range of that you see the you see the ones where it's just the spam phishing or whatever um but then you see the ones where it's like tailored to you yeah we yeah. seen sometimes <laughs> one time where the company kind of warned us like hey don't hacked or something in the subject line like it was and then we we know mm -hmm. that's how we know that it was a business email compromise but then like that just reminded me of my days in the sock <laughs> i was applying to somebody and the company we were monitoring they pretty much had their account compromised and the only thing i kind of picked up on that was fishy about them is they didn't have the right signature they should have had mm. and this is so people that are interviewing or trying to get an ir sock role if you want to kind of stand out 
of course know your stuff, but being super technical ain't always the answer. Like some of the stuff can be found very simply mm -hmm. through research. You can look through the ticketing system. You can find something. Hey, this don't add up. But if they want to ask you something about fishing or saying if you if you knew somebody was compromised, what would you look at? Say, hey, I'll pay attention to their signature. See if their signature is the same to everybody else's. Because mm -hmm. a lot of times it's not. A lot of times they don't attach the right signature, and it's kind of like a red flag, mm -hmm. and you don't know who they are. Or if you got doubts, call them. He's <laughs> like, no, nah, I didn't send nothing. Okay. Let's yeah. go ahead and, and reset his password, exit out all the sessions, and see what happened. Mm -hmm. And then that's when – they're going to start, IR going to do all that, the remediation, the containment, and then we're going to send it to forensics and we're going to tell you what you need to do. Yeah, and even, even if, like, the emails kind of, because, you know, some people have thousands and thousands of emails to go through, um, even when we're not really finding anything in the emails, it could be, like, their sign-in activity. That's yeah. like Or, like, like if, you're only, if you're using Outlook, why do all of a sudden you have, like, a Mac sign-in? Mm -hmm. So it's... That yep. those are also clues too that that we use, and in addition to the emails too. Yeah, and that's when we work with detections and and IM team where we put in rules to say, hey, mm -hmm. we're gonna block unusual sign ins, and we're gonna make them say, hey, is this you? Yeah, yeah, especially when um like there's sign in activities like all over the country. A, a lot of the stuff, a lot of the times, we have to verify with the company. Like, is that normal for the? Because people travel. Yeah. So we have to confirm did this person travel to this state in these x days but if it's from a, co a country that's like a country Nigeria interest yeah or even like the netherlands sometimes yeah With that's VPNs pretty much always like that. that's pretty much always bad um still verify but yeah um yeah so certain things you over like over the course of you doing case after case after case and seeing um iocs that pop up all Look the time you. oh Look at you. Let me find out you be on the stand-ups. <laughs> and seeing IOCs that um, pop up all the time, you kind of just know what to look for. Of course, every case is different. There's go there's always something new. Like the QR code for one of my coworkers, they've never seen that before. That was like their first time seeing um, a hack through the QR code actually being used in real life. Mm -hmm. um, but certain, most of the times, you know what to look for. You know certain countries are um, bad. Um, certain ISPs are bad. Um, and then, of course, we use like virus total um, to see if certain uh, IP addresses have been flagged. So it's not just off the dome that we do this. Like we, we I, I think it's like a misconception. Like people. Did you want to talk about that? No, yeah, oh. no, no. Lee. <laughs> OK, I'm, I'm, I'm here. I'm just I'm just a, I'm just a host. Like talk about whatever you want to talk about. Yeah. Like I think it's a misconception that um, that I mean, of course, we're smart, but. We use Google all the time. There's like websites that we go on to to double check or make sure that that things are malicious because we don't we don't always know. So yeah, that, that's all I wanted to say. Do y'all have a sandbox that y'all use? Um, if we do, I'm I'm unaware of it. Okay. Yeah, you might have like <clears throat> well, in a sense, the virus total is kind of like a virtual sandbox, but some threat actors know when like if they put the link in the sandbox, it's not going to do right. Well, not a, not necessarily a sandbox, but like for example, you got like URL scan, mm -hmm. the IO. That's one that people use a lot. You know, scan it and tell you what the redirects are. Mm -hmm. They give you a screenshot. Virus total, uh, browsing Joe sandbox. But then sometimes you need your actual own sandbox to where you can detonate it, where you can probably do a little bit malware. Well, if it's malware, you can analyze what happens when the malware starts. Oh, that's probably on on the testing department. The testing side probably does that, um, but. What I've been doing in in DFIR, we um we don't do that at this company. Okay. And testing um isn't part of my rotation, so gotcha. unfortunately, I'll I'll send you I'll send you. Well, I just say it right here too. I'll send you TCM security stuff. Oh yeah. Especially I don't know if you did that malware analysis course, but no, I did um I did the um Windows Ex escalation privilege escalation yeah. for vendors. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So uh, they got that. They got the Python joint. I. Been busy, so I haven't finished my detection engineering course on there, but they got that on there too. But that malware analysis course is going to make you very sharp when it comes to forensics. So, okay, yes, that would be probably the one I would recommend for you to do because the, the instructor is cool. We got Discord you can sign up on. Mm -hmm. So, uh, for your personal computer, you got PC, you got a Mac, PC, okay, cool. Because Mac has made it hard to even do virtual box stuff, like because on the malware analysis course, you got to set up your environment, then you have to segment it. 
well on the Macs, you can't even segment it anymore. It's like mm. impossible. Yeah, I've never, I've admittedly have never used the Mac. I like, I like my um, Lenovo. See, for me, I'm a, I'm a creator. I'm a creator, oh, okay. so I like my, um, I love my Mac. I don't use it as much because I got a gaming machine now that I use for my lab, and pretty much I do like a lot of work off there now because it's more convenient. But I got like two desks like in my office. But anyways, that's, that's kind of where it is on there. But let's talk about some of the non-technical things or maybe some things that you okay. discovered when it comes to IR forensics, have you been tasked with drawing up the IR report to send out to people? I actually just got tasked with that for the first time last week to write a report. <clears throat> so um, that was new. And also I've been learning a lot about like the legal aspects of things because we are dealing with like client. Well, so the way it works is like, yes, our clients are the company that's been attacked, but technically our clients is, um, are the attorneys that they're dealing with. Like they're the ones that really mm -hmm. source this. Um, so a lot of like, a lot of the times where it, where a company wants to report, like for example, the case I'm working on now, um, it's about to wrap up actually. Mom. But the case I'm working on now, um, they, they had um, wire fraud, like transfers that they didn't recognize. Um, through the bank. And this company is based in Mexico. So I, I'm not sure how it works in Mexico, but the bank was like, um, oh, it, it was our fault. You know, don't worry about it. But they, they didn't tell them why. And here is legally required to at least, but uh, in Mexico, maybe things are different. So what they wanted from our report was to basically have us say that, hey, we didn't find anything malicious on our end. So we would really like for you, Bank, to follow up with what happened. Um, and what I learned from that was like the, the legality of what the words you can use and say is very important because we actually did find malicious activity, but it was from it was from um, events that weren't related to this. So we had to write that in a report, like we didn't find malicious activity as it relates to this case or as it relates to this incident. Because if we said we didn't find malicious activity legally, we would get in trouble because we did. It just didn't relate to this case. So that's something I, I mean, it's kind of it's out of the box, but that's kind of the stuff that I've been learning um, that goes hand in hand with this is like the, the legality of things, too. OK, look at you. I'm going to say that all the time because it's like. <laughs> It's funny. It's like you just you're just learning, but it's good that this yeah. was like like your first experience. So, what would you say to people who are find themselves in a the position you were in? Maybe they are junior or senior in college. What would you tell them right now about staying the course and trying to get into a position like yourself? I mean, I know you've already said it, but I. I just really want to stress like working on independent projects because like I said, that's, that's what I feel like I, I messed up in. I was way too focused on the fact that college was going to teach me everything. And it just, it just didn't, it just didn't. It, t it taught me like the definitions of things and the, the theory of things, but it did not teach me the hands on. So I was stressed doing independent projects. And also if we're going to talk just, you know, abstractly um, to bet on yourself, because there, there are going to be people that's going to tell you um, no. There's going to be doors shut time after time after time. And you're going to find yourself comparing yourself to peers who seem to be getting it right. And they're getting offers and they're getting internships. And you're going to wonder, like, what it is that you're doing wrong. Uh, so I would, that's what I would say. Just bet on yourself and really focus on doing independent projects. Um, like I said earlier, certifications are great, but um, companies really care about the hands-on and if you're applying what you're learning. So that would be the advice I would give to the juniors and seniors out there. So would you suggest that also people who are, are wanting to go into college, should they do a little bit more in-depth researching on the program that they'll be in? Yes, um, definitely look at your curriculum like there should when you're picking your major, there should be like a a full kind of like timeline of all the classes that you'll take and even the electives. 
Um, so I would really do a deep dive into the major itself to make sure like those are classes that you feel like um, you want to take or that would that would help you in whatever your career goal is, even if you don't have it fully figured out. And also, um, don't just look at one major, but look at others because um, you might want to have a backup plan. The reality is college can be hard and life happens. Um, I'll be honest. Um, I had um, failed a class like three times. And at one point I was going to like get kicked out of the major because like the school of actually I did get kicked out of the major. The school of engineering does not play that. <laughs> so uh, I went from cybersecurity to information security is literally the exact same. It was just with different schools. It was a school of engineering was for cybersecurity and the school of arts and sciences was for information security. It was the exact same major. So I would I, I would do a deep dive on the different majors. Um, luckily, my school had a function where you could. Um, they, sh they showed you related majors to the major that you were taking and also like related jobs in the field of the re of the major that you were taking. So um, I would utilize all of that, have a backup plan um, and look at those classes to see if that's what you wanted. Because like I said, I dropped out of international business just because of business calculus. Literally, that alone was enough to make me drop out of the major. <laughs> so um, do that ahead of time so you're not switching majors, your junior year because then it'll it might throw off your track of graduation luckily when i switched majors from cybersecurity to information security because the classes were essentially the same i didn't lose um like my graduation time didn't get pushed back but if i had to switch completely different majors um it would have so do that ahead of time so you're not you know um a, you don't end up like a semester or two behind than what you were on track to be right and I'll ask you this. What's been like one of the bigger challenges you faced early on in your professional career that either you like you found out like you figured out how to get through it or, or what that maybe school didn't prepare you for kind of. Could you talk about that? Yeah, so I would say the biggest challenge I'm facing now I think it has more to do with like my personality really. And I'm pretty sure there's people that could relate, but um, I'm kind of, I can be like a recluse at times. And I falsely believed because this is what the stereotype was that like it, you could be recluse. Like you can just kind of just sit at your desk. You don't have to talk to any clients or you don't have to talk to anybody. Um, and that is just not the case. So I had to kind of like get back on board of like the teamwork aspect of things. I had to get on my Zoom. <laughs> <laughs> I had to get on my Zoom. So that's a challenge that I'm I'm kind of still facing. That's why I, I like to go in on Mondays because that is the time that I get to be alone. Um, but that's not always going to be the case for people. Like I'm lucky to have a hybrid job, but you might not. So um, that is the challenge is is knowing your work environment. And also, I don't really have this problem like. I'm I'm pretty outspoken. Like I I keep it real. Um, I say how I feel, but um, I would say a challenge for me would be um, knowing when to not keep it real. I guess like the work environment can be very political. Contact. Yeah, the work environment can be very political, and um, you're going to be working with people who have been in the game for years, probably longer than I've been alive. So, um, and there's just certain things that just don't fly. So that would be something else that I'm, I'm working on too. So. Okay. Yeah. I definitely, I know, I love how I played a long game. Yeah. It's like me and my other coworker, like when we peep some, we'll talk about it amongst ourselves and we just say, okay, mm -hmm. notating that we playing the long game. Yeah. Cause sometimes Every time, everything don't deserve a response then. Exactly. But when it's time to respond, it's going to be time to respond. And that's what a lot of people don't know. Like, I think I think I made a TikTok or someone. It was like a questions about, like, corporate America and, and working and how to, can you actually be yourself? And I was like, truthfully, kind of you can be aspects of yourself, but not your full self. Yeah. You just can't. Because if you could really be your full self, uh people will possibly like you or may not like you because you'll be able to talk to them how you want to or tell them mm -hmm. exactly what you're not going to do. <laughs> like, yeah. there's a lot of stuff that, that comes with it. So you just got to figure out how to bring the best representation of yourself to the company every day you're there. 
Mm-hmm. And I think when people figure that out, that's when they'll be successful. And like you said, people have the misconception that you can really just be in a room all dark with your hoodie on. That's typically more for, and not really all the time for engineering roles, because you're still going to have to address if you're working on a product or a project, you're going to have to do your meetings from time to time, even mm-hmm. your coding. So there is going to be some type of human interaction in your job. You just got to figure out what amount works for you. Like for me, I definitely could not do one of my jobs. The reason why I left is so many meetings. I don't like talking to people yeah. for pointless meetings. I don't like being on camera for something that's pointless. I'm just, I don't mm-hmm. like this could have been an email. Yeah. One day <laughs> I'm going to wear the shirt. So when I'm on a camera and they say this could have been an email. So mm-hmm. they get the picture. Hey, this could have been an email. Yeah. One of my, oh, I can't, oh, I can't even describe him because then it will give away too much information. But one of my coworkers is pretty high profile in the field. Uh, well, he's not my coworker, but someone that works at my company who's high, who's um, high profile in the field, um, stated that he he refuses to turn his camera on in meetings because he doesn't want people to see the faces he make whenever they say something stupid. He can do that because he's a senior at this. But um, it's just funny that even someone who's who's been doing this and still doing it feels that way too. He's right. <laughs> I, I definitely know. I have to show you some off camera about that. Yeah, I, I like to use the avatar a lot of times. When I want to be on there, I just use my avatar. I'm like, look, yeah. you're going to get this. This is the best thing you're going to get. Mm-hmm. But where can the listeners, where can they follow you at and like, like on your social media? And how, how can they find you? Yeah, so my Twitter is at MKYA Makaya Gonza, G O N Z A. I have my LinkedIn in the bio, um, but my LinkedIn is Makaya Gonzalez. It's just my name. Um, connect with me there. I'll connect back. Um, but yeah, I really mainly just use Twitter. I'm not on LinkedIn that much. So I use Twitter. Um, I do have an Instagram, but it's more so like personal. I don't talk tech on there at all. I don't do anything tech related on my Instagram. So I, if you want to connect on the business aspect of things, I recommend Twitter and LinkedIn. You got anything you want to leave the listeners with? Do I have anything to leave the listeners with? Um, yeah, make this a good 2024. Like you said, this is the first in person, in person for the year. Do do I challenge you guys to to do 10 new things this year that you've never done before. I feel like 2024 is the year for growth. I know they say this every year, but <laughs> it's a leap year. So there's something special about this year. That chick stepping on them steps. Yeah. There's, <laughs> there's something special about this year. So um, any project that you've been holding off because you feel like it's not the right time, it's never going to be a right time. Do it now. Uh, anything you've been um, wanting to let go, let it go. And if you needed to hear it, you're hearing it from me. So, mm-hmm. yeah. And I'm going to leave y'all with this. If you do not read the rule book, your head will be shaved. <laughs> 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 All right, man. It's been another episode of Textual Toss. I'm your host, HD. Y'all know what to do, man. Subscribe to the Patreon so you can support us doing great episodes like this. Also, like I said in my couple other videos, if you want to do group coaching, I do have that link in the description as well where you can get group coaching, access to me and my private Slack channel so I can help you out in your career. But, I don't have to be too much hands-on with you. (laughs) But until next time, we out. Peace.